All right, it is 10.02 and we have a packed agenda today. So, well, 10.02 in snowy Colorado. Uh, and we have a packed agenda today, so let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Larry Eames. I use he, him, his pronouns. And welcome to the HELP, I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian webinar series, or as we call it, HELP for short. Uh, this series is brought to you by the American Library Association's Government Documents Roundtable and we have special guests today, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, you will be muted during this webinar, but we encourage you to participate in chat. If you don't see a chat window, you can click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. We also encourage you to send questions via the Q&A function throughout today's session. We'll save questions for the end, but we encourage you to submit them as you think of them. If there are any technical issues, Samantha Hagar is on hand to help. Feel free to use chat to get in touch with her. Worst case scenario though, do remember that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared to our YouTube channel later. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned for our spring slate of webinars. If you have topics or ideas that you would like to see presented, please let me know. Uh, I'm gonna drop a handful of links here in the chat. Uh, for everyone to stay in touch with us. You can shoot me an email if you have ideas and to see more of our previous webinars, you can check out our YouTube channel. And if you're a YouTube user, please uh, go give us a follow. It'd be great to have that. Uh, so today's webinar is US and international election data. And I'm going to turn it over to Charmaine to introduce our speakers. Hi everybody, can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yes, we yes, can. Yes, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the GoDart Health and Pippers um, Professional Development Webinar on Domestic and Foreign Elections. My name is Charmaine Enriquez, and I'm one of the committee members serving on the Pippers um, Professional Development Committee. Um, today, we have two wonderful experts who will discuss and show us search strategies and resources for conducting research on domestic and international and, and foreign elections. Um, including finding raw and aggregate data. They will speak for 40 minutes, 20 minutes each, and there will be additional 20 minutes um, left for Q&A. So as Larry said, don't forget to put your questions um, in the chat box. Our US election speaker is Catherine Morse. Catherine was previously the International Documents Librarian at Northwestern University Libraries and is currently the Government Information Law and Political Science Librarian at the University of Michigan Libraries. She holds the MLIS from Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois, and has been a longtime member of Godart. Catherine serves as, as um, Pippers member at large from uh, 2018 to 2020, and is finishing up her two-year term on the membership committee, of which she was chair in 2019-2020. Our second speaker, the foreign election specialist, is Jeremy Darrington. Jeremy, um, who received his M MLIS at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, is the politics librarian at Princeton University. He has served as the Pippers sectional chair, was the past chair of the Review and Planning Committee, and is currently the chair of the Mar Marta Lang Sage CQ Press Award Committee, an award he received himself in 2020 for distinguished contributions to librarianship in political science by an academic librarian. We are very excited and fortunate to have Catherine and Jeremy here with us today. And before I turn it over to Catherine, I would also like to mention that the next Pippers um, webinar series will happen in April and it will be about international human rights and um, climate change instruction. So please join us for that one. Catherine, go ahead. All right, thank you, Charmaine. Um, Okay, so first I'm gonna share the link to my slides. And then I'm going to try sharing my screen. Okay, do you see my slides, US elections data? Yep, looks yep. good, Catherine. Excellent, all right, great. Yes, yeah, so I'm Catherine, um, she, her pronouns. And um, I have been at Michigan for 17 years now. And um, when I get asked uh, about elections data, um, I have a whole um, series of questions, follow-up questions that I ask um, the researcher. So 
it usually starts with somebody saying, well, I'm interested in finding elections data. And then the follow-up questions I always ask are kind of like, which election are we talking about? What kind of race are we talking about president? Are we talking about municipal elections? Um, and then we need to know what kind of geography are we talking about presidential elections um, data at the at the county level? Are we talking about congressional election data by district? Uh, of course, we would need to know the time period. Um, and then as you talk more to the researcher, you will start to get a sense of if they want election results, like numbers, counts of who voted for whom, or are they asking for things that would lead you away from results and more to polls? So are they asking for, I, I'm interested in how many evangelical voters voted in a certain way, or how many white women voted in a particular way? Um, those kinds of questions lead us to um, polls and studies of like voter attitudes or identities. Another thing that we can ask our researchers is what kind of format are you looking for? So if somebody says they want um, um, to map elections data, are they looking for a map that's already made and they just want to see which states are red and which states are blue? Or are they looking for um, data that they're going to be incorporating into uh, GIS or geographic information systems? Um, so maybe they need a large data set that is going to be particularly compatible, compatible for working with GIS. Okay, so if we are looking for election results, there are many different places you can go for this and lots of different options out there. And at first I started listing them all and then I was afraid that it was gonna be like really long and overwhelming. So I, I narrowed it down, um, but just know that there's a lot out there. Here are some of the, the ones that I have used before. So this is a place where you can, these are places where you can get presidential and congressional election results. These are freely available sources to you. So the clerk of the house um, has a website where you can get um, results for the last 100 years, uh, but these are in PDF, so that may or may not meet your needs. Um, the Federal Election Commission has uh, data and offers it in um, spreadsheet as well as PDF, right? And then the American Presidency Project um, offers a lot of um, election statistics as well. There are subscription resources that you can turn to to find elections data. And Usually the benefit of why you might turn to some of these resources is if you want to get a lot of data and you're hoping um, to get a spreadsheet in as few clicks as possible. So one option out there is CQ Voting and Elections. Um, if your institution subscribes to this product, they have a download data section. And, um, and you can put your, um, your parameters together, you can request things like um, presidential data at the county level, you can add all the years, and then you can um, click on the download button. Other places where you can get this data is uh, Data Planet or Statista, as well as others. When you need lots of data, um, then I recommend going to the MIT Election Data and Science Lab. Um, so let me try clicking on this now. Okay, so they do a really nice job of presenting um, long time series of data in a really easy to download format. Um, so let's say we were interested in county presidential election returns from 2000 to 2020. Okay, let me move this. Okay. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of what this looks like, um, this kind of tabular data, uh, if we were to download that, this would work well for a user who wants to um, like join up a table in GIS if they wanted to add county level presidential uh, election results to some other geographic data they were working with. 
um, this is what it looks like. So you can see we've got state and county and then um, a county FIPS number. So this makes it um, really easy to put into uh, to GIS or into some kind of like mapping program. Okay. If your institution is an ICPSR member, um, then ICPSR is a great place to go to get, um, to download large sets of election data. Um, so I'll show what some of the things that they have. Okay, so this is the US Historical Elections Return Series that ICPSR has. So you can get things like candidate name and constituency totals um, from 1788 to 1990, um, general election data from 1950 to 1990, lots of good stuff here. All right. So if you are looking for election information more at the state level, um, there's a lot of interest, I think, in looking at um, direct democracy initiatives and ballot initiatives and referendum. So one of the sites I like to go to for that is the IRI Initiative and Referendum Institute. So they will provide an overview of, um, of what ballot initiatives were up in a particular election kind of by date. And then they also have um, data they make available that gives you the number of initiatives and how many were approved by state and by year. Um, I also want to mention um, how great state websites can be. So um, states, whoever, whatever executive agency within the state is in charge of elections, so maybe that's the Secretary of State or maybe there's a different um, name for whoever runs the state's elections, but their website will often be a great place to go to get election results data. And uh, I link here to a Wikipedia page that links out to state's um, election offices. So that's another great place to go. Okay, if you are looking for local elections data or city elections, mayoral elections, um, your city clerk's office webpage might um, have everything you need. Local newspapers might be doing a good job covering. Um, I also like Ballotpedia. They cover the 100 largest cities, that's largest by population. And Ballotpedia is also useful for, um, if you're looking for school board elections. Um, so they, they cover 470 different school districts. So that's the school districts from the 100 largest municipalities and then also um, the largest school districts in addition to that. So this is the page that they have um, devoted to school boards. And they also have um, a page specifically about school board recalls. I thought this was really interesting because that's been um, a subject that we've seen in the news lately. So here is some of the school board um, recall information. And there's Michigan with seven recalls. What do you know? Okay. Okay, so earlier I mentioned maps. Um, like I said, when, when researchers say I'm looking to map um, election results, then the follow-up question I always ask is like, are you looking for a pre-made map or are you working with GIS? If somebody wants pre-made maps and they wanna see red states and blue states, um, the 
presidential election results map from the American Presidency Project is a great place to go. If your institution subscribes to Social Explorer, um, you can get uh, those maps um, covering the period from 1912 to 2020. If you have a researcher who is using GIS, um, there are some good places to go. Um, the Voting and Election Science Team Dataverse is particularly useful. I'll open that up. So um, what you can get here is both results at different geographies and then also the boundaries, the shape files. Um, so both of those things could be of interest. So we can get um, precinct level election results here um, for the last couple of elections. Okay, so if um, the research question is really about finding data about people's attitudes or voter demographics or polling, then we can turn to some different resources. So there are these long running studies of voter attitudes and voter behaviors. And one of them is the American National Election Study. ANES, and that has been running since 1948. If your institution is an ICPSR member, you can access their data through ICPSR if you want, or you can access it from their website. Um, you can download a cumulative file that has all the data from 1948 um, to the more recent data, or you can do it year by year. And they ask questions um, of their panel of things like, um, you know, how much faith do you have in institutions? How do you feel about the news? Um, how often do you go to church? All sorts of questions. So if, if the researcher is trying to, um, trying to do some research into how people with different kinds of beliefs or different kinds of backgrounds might feel um, about voting or about a party, um, this would be a good place to go. Okay. Um, exit poll data is really important. Um, since when you go to vote and you fill out your ballot, you're not actually providing any kind of demographic information about yourself. These exit polls are one way that we can make those conclusions that this is the candidate that young people voted for, or this is the candidate that women voted for. Um, so the Roper Public Opinion Poll Archive is a great place to go for exit poll data. So here we are looking at um, a page from their elections and presidents page um, comparing uh, Carter and Mondale with Ford and Dole. Um, some other places you can go to get polling data would be the Pew Research Center. They have a lot of um, interesting stuff about voters and about um, how likely they are to vote, what turnout was, um, what they feel strongly about. And Gallup is another organization that, that does a lot of polling in this area and especially about um, attitudes about politics. So um, questions like, um, what is the most important issue of the day? And do you think the country is going in the right direction? Do you think the economy is going in the right direction? These are the kinds of polls that we hear about in the news a lot. Um, Gallup does those. Okay, if 
uh, part of the research question is uh, finding data about voter participation. Um, here are some sites you can turn to. So the United States Election Project has um, voter turnout and voter turnout demographics. This is what, um, what that website looks like. Um, so they have national turnout rates from 1787 to, to 2018. Okay, the Census Bureau is another place you can go to get some voting and registration data as well. So I, I know a lot of us work on college campuses, so I wanted to be sure to include this study because I think it's really interesting. Um, but um, if you have ever wondered what it's like on your own college campus in terms of how, how active are students with voting, um, this study, the National Study of Learning, Voting and Engagement um, tracks voting on college campuses. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of the executive summary from the 2020 report. Um, but, it, but they found that students were very motivated. There was unprecedented turnout. Um, they had a higher um, voting yield than in the 2016 election. They also found that younger college students were um, more active with voting than, than older college students. I thought that was quite interesting. If your institution is a member of this study, a participant in this study, then you might, there might be somebody at your institution that gets a report specifically tailored to your institution. So we had a, a big initiative on our campus in 2020. We had a whole theme semester devoted to um, democracy and elections. And um, we have a student engagement center that um, was leading a lot of these efforts and the library worked with them and we thought about um, you know different different ways we could collaborate and um, and I know that the our student engagement center is the liaison for the University of Michigan in this study and so um, after the 2020 election was over I reached out to that student engagement center and I said, hey, do we, do we have the report yet? And they sent it to me um, and it was really interesting to see. And it's really, um, you know, it felt really great to read because I saw how um, participation on our campus had increased over previous elections. And so that was, that was really nice to see. Um, all right. So I think I am close to the end of my time, but I just wanted to say that my, um, my tip that I really recommend is to look for live guides for other, the way other libraries have put together live guides for elections. And one of the live guides that I use a great deal is Jeremy's elections live guide. So this is for the Princeton Library um, Voting and Elections Research Guide. And I really appreciate how it is organized kind of by the geography of, of data you might be looking at. So that is my, that is my tip for you all. If all else fails, uh, look for someone's live guide and hopefully you can find it that way. All right, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing now and hand it over to you, Jeremy. All right, let me unmute myself and share my screen here. Oops. All right, can you guys see my slides here? Awesome. Yeah. All right, so um, that was a great presentation from Catherine, and you're going to see some clear overlap in the strategies we use because these are trying to uh, strategies for for finding elections data. And 
I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Obviously, this is going to be um, a little bit uh, challenging to do. You know, uh, the big challenge with with foreign election data, international elections, is is just the diversity of stuff that's out there, right? So, like, some, a lot of the stuff that Catherine mentioned in terms of, you know, the challenges of trying to find uh, election data is uh, just exacerbated by dealing with stuff outside of the United States, right? So <clears throat> I often point out when I talk about US elections to people, you know, just the challenge that federalism brings in terms of trying to find data, everything from decentralized election administration, you know, the county or other levels, you know, the great divergence in laws, regulations, reporting requirements, et cetera, uh, difficulties sort of lining up boundaries to the things that people actually wanna find. All of that is like uh, present, except for maybe the decentralized elections administration part in most countries is not so bad, but um, it's just kind of amped up on steroids when you deal with sort of foreign elections and makes life um, a lot harder to deal with. And <clears throat> so then you get to throw in language barriers, right? <laughs> Which is just gonna make all of this uh, much more challenging. And, you know, one of the, um, the things that comes up is, is, you know, one of the big challenges has to do with just the complexity of electoral systems. So at least in the United States, we're dealing mostly with just like one typical election uh, system, one type of uh, way of governing sort of voting and the allocation of votes. Um, but, you know, there are um, quite a few different types of electoral systems um, out there in the world. And the way to really think about this is, you know, well, I'll show you a slide in a minute that kind of outlines what some of these look like, but you really want to think about these in terms of sort of a, a continuum of how proportional elections are. And that's, you know, how well the votes that people cast actually translate into seats for parties that they favor, right? Um, and related to that is sort of what we call the level of wasted votes, which is how many votes people cast for parties that don't win any seats in the legislature, right? Um, and so if you have a non proportional system, like a typical sort of plurality first past the post system, you know, if you have two parties in a single uh, seat district, whatever, and, and you know, you vote for your party and 48% people vote for your party, and 52% of people vote for the other party in that district. Well, 48% of the people don't get anything out of their vote, right? They don't get uh, a party that they care about, a candidate they care about, right? So um, different systems have different methods for making those uh, votes be a bit more proportional in terms of translating into actual party support in a legislature. Now, there are other things that play into this, um, and a big one is, is district magnitude. And this is something that's really different than in the United States generally, right, is that in lots of systems, um, many countries have, have a parliamentary system, um, and in most of those systems outside the United States, many districts um, have a more than one seat available in a particular district, right? So you might have a, a particular, you know, sort of legislative district and it might award two seats, it might award four seats. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on the system. And so that's gonna have an impact on uh, sort of the party support that ends up getting seats in a particular legislative uh, district or legislature at a particular point in time. Other things that matter um, are the way the seats are allocated, right? So um, when you have a proportional system, you can have different methods for deciding, well, what percentage of votes at what particular sort of stage in the allocation translates into seats. And that's a little bit complicated. I'm not gonna go into it, but just know there are sort of different methods uh, for doing that that can have implications for how many votes translate into seats and uh, how proportional the outcome ends up being. And then in, uh, because proportional representation means that you're likely to have many more parties represented in your legislator, legislature or parliament, um, many countries will impose some kind of minimum threshold, right? So you have to get like 2% of votes for your party uh, in order to, you know, get seats allocated or maybe it's 5%. Some places it's really high is like 10%, right? Um, which has the effect of reducing fragmentation in terms of how many parties are represented. So you don't end up with like 20 parties in your legislature. Um, but it then means that you're going to have sort of more wasted votes, right? Because some people may vote for a party that doesn't pass the threshold. They don't get represented in uh, the legislature at all. So just kind of a visual cue of what that sort of looks like, right? Um, when you look at electoral systems, um, this is this comes from the ACE Electoral uh, Knowledge Project. Um, it's a super great source, and I'll show you a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, but this is a nice little diagram just to show kind of the complexity involved here that, you know, running from sort of the least proportional systems, these kind of plurality, first past the post systems, this is typically what we're familiar with in Anglo-American elections. You know, whoever wins the most votes in that single seat district wins. 
um, to such uh, more, much more proportional kinds of uh, versions and many things in between, all sorts of varieties for how this is done. Um, and I'll just, as a side note, mention that electoral uh, systems terminology is super confusing. It's very jargony. It can be really confusing to talk about. Even experts in this area in English are often confusing each other because some of the terminology is not super clear. Um, and there's a great piece in a recent Oxford handbook on uh, electoral systems that makes a whole argument about sort of terminology, lays out some of the terminology, uh, talks about some ways of uh, thinking about you know, maybe coming up with some better terminology. But the problem is, of course, that a lot of these things have a long, long history, and it's hard sometimes to dislodge the jargon once it's already there. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is going to look really familiar from Catherine's presentation, because this uh, same kinds of questions that I ask uh, are the same kinds of questions that she was mentioning. So first, you know, what kind of election are we dealing with? Um, is it parliamentary, or are we talking presidential elections, right? That's a big uh, difference. You know, most uh, countries have, uh, you know, especially in Europe, um, have parliamentary systems, right? That's the seat of both a legislative and executive power. Um, some places are hybrid, have both a parliament and a president. Um, the level of sort of power differential between those two can vary a lot between different systems. Um, also, you know, you have uh, different regional things. So sometimes there are sort of regional bodies that may be of interest to people or local municipal elections, like Catherine mentioned. There can also be, you know, supranational institutions like the European Parliament, which I'm not really going to talk about, but add sort of an additional layer of complexity. Probably more relevant, though, um, is also to think about like what kinds of results people are looking at. So I'm only talking about election results here. Like Catherine mentioned, there are lots of other things related to elections that I'm not going to get into related to sort of public opinion and other kinds of uh, uh, data. But even just here in terms of election results, um, often people think, well, I just want party votes. I just want total votes, right? Um, but you may also be interested not just in, in party votes, but maybe people are just mostly interested in party vote shares. Like what percentage of the vote did particular parties win, right? That might be a better indication of sort of broad support and, uh, you know, cleavages in a particular country than just total votes. Um, but you may also want to know, like, well, how did those things translate into seats and control in the act of power in the actual legislature, right? Um, so you might look for seat totals um, by party. You might look for seat shares, like the percentage of seats that are uh, seats. <laughs> That was a tongue twister. Um, that a particular party wins in a in a legislature, right? Those are all different things, and they'll be reported um, somewhat differently. Of course, geographic level matters a lot. You know, are you looking just at the national level? Are you interested at sort of the constituency or kind of the district? Um, are you interested in sort of breakdowns by you know uh, sort of subnational jurisdictions um, below the constituency? Um, those are all things to uh, take into consideration. And then, of course, you know what time period. Um, I'll just make a note that, you know, it's hard enough sometimes to find uh, good election data for some countries, um, even for the current stuff, and going back in time can be really, really difficult, sometimes impossible, right? Um, there are even well-established democracies, um, I'm thinking here like United, United States, uh, like Catherine mentioned, we have lots of great data, but there's lots of stuff that's just, you know, it wasn't preserved. Um, but even other places, I was working on a question recently for somebody who was interested in um, constituency results in France, you know, from the late 19th century to, you know, kind of the present. Well, it turns out that um, they just weren't well documented. Um, they weren't well preserved. There are some historical sources in France for the late 19th century, early 20th century that report, you know, actual constituency results by candidate name, but not by parties because the party system itself was not well developed and it wasn't generally reported. There wasn't an electoral body that did it because there were frequent changes of regime, right? And it's not until after World War II was sort of the establishment of the Fourth Republic in France that you really get sort of consistent uh, election data that, that you can find. Um, and then sometimes, you know, things happen, right? Like fires happen um, in France is another good example. Some um, regional data and some subnational data um, has been lost, you know, due to uh, destruction um, in a major archive. You know, so those kinds of things happen as well. And then finally, what format do you want, right? Um, you know, are you just fine with some kind of list of results? That's going to make your life a lot easier, you and your researcher. If you want machine-readable format um, data, there are definitely options, um, but you may be more limited, especially depending on, you know, countries. So, like, in developing world, that's often going to be a lot harder. So, um, one, one other thing I will say is, um, let me see if I can 
flip over to, can you see my website or my browser now? Has anybody seen that? Yep, looks yep. good. Okay, just wanna make sure we're sharing. So, um, you know, there are, uh, I mentioned here, if you wanna get sort of details, and I have a lot of these linked on, on my guide that I'll share, but, um, you know, this is from this uh, electoral project, the ACE electoral project that sort of lays out the differences in electoral systems. If you want to read more about them, their advantages, disadvantages, things like that. But for many elections, it's also really helpful to get that context before you go searching. Make sure you understand what sort of the electoral system is and what the various um, sort of key uh, geographies are going to be, what they're called in their native languages, because that's going to be important as you go searching for that kind of data. Um, and sometimes just the broader context, right? Because an important thing to keep in mind for you and your research researcher is that, you know, elections in lots of places are pretty shady, right? And so there are going to be cases where like, you know, there may be election data, it may be available even in a nice machine readable format, but it may be completely bogus, right? So keeping that kind of uh, context in mind is really helpful. And there's some good sources that, you know, you can use, obviously you can look at news sources, Wikipedia is always a good sort of first cut sometimes just to kind of get kind of a little bit of the lay of the land. But like the Journal of Democracy uh, has a great section. They've been tracking since the early 90s, um, you know, elections. You get these sort of nice coverage of like, you know, just a rundown of what happened in a particular election, um, give you a, a better sense of context, which can be sometimes really helpful to sort of understand what was going on, what might be some of the issues or traps that might be there. The uh, IFES, the International... Um, Foundation for Electoral Systems has a lot of really great information uh, as well. And they have a whole section dedicated to sort of election FAQs or little primers. Um, and these are especially useful to kind of get a uh, sort of a taste of what's coming up in particular elections to see like what's going to be at stake. They often have a little sort of infographic that lays out kind of key data about the election. But we'll give you a little bit of context, especially about sort of the electoral uh, and legal sort of system, how voting is going to be uh, carried out. And that can provide some useful context as well. So let me go back to the slide. All right. Um, so thinking about sources, I'm trying to keep my eye on time, um, possible places to look for, for data, for elections data, because it's such a big world in so many countries, right? This is going to be all over the place. I can only give you this sort of broad brush strokes. Happy to answer questions, you know, to the extent that I know anything about it. Um, a good place often to start, though, uh, especially if you want kind of comparative data, is to look for some at some of the big academic data collections. Um, typically, these are are limited usually to sort of parliamentary lower house because that's kind of the common denominator for many forms of government across the world, and it makes it sort of much more comparable. So you can get these uh, results at individual constituency levels across lots of parliaments at one time. A good example of that is um, the CLEA data set. I can find it here where I put it. Um, this is a, a big project that's been around it's constituency level elections archive. Um, they actually have some upper chamber stuff, but not, not nearly as much as, as the lower chamber stuff is kind of the primary source of, of data in here. And because it's you know the primary source of government for many countries, you can see the different countries that are uh, covered in here. It's quite a few countries, and you get a sort of layout of, of where they go. Some places go back quite a far time historically, um, but typically you're looking at sort of you know kind of uh, after the post war or sort of you know mid 70s for many countries that are sort of newer democracies. Um, you can download this all, it's all in sort of like data uh, set format and like Stata format or other kinds of forms. But you also, if you just want to get like a spreadsheet of one or a couple of elections, you can go in and have this sort of subsetting tool that will let you just kind of filter down by country and by time period uh, and choose just the election sort of sets that you want, which is pretty nice. So it's a nice place to start if you want kind of broad coverage of, of lots of uh, countries in a comparable sort of nice tidy data format. Now, uh, for many places, depending on what you want, you're going to need to go beyond that. Um, and the best place to start, and this was like Catherine mentioned, sort of like in the United States, if you go down to the state you know, level, uh, same thing here at the country level, you're often going to want to look for the official electoral commission, um, which has sort of the responsibility for you know, conducting elections and or sort of reporting election data. Um, not every country has one of these, um, but, you know, in contrast to the United States, many countries do have one that cover elections across the entire country, which makes uh, life a little bit easier. 
Um, sometimes another source to look at are sort of government open data sites um, can be also useful places. And I'll show you a couple examples of these. So just as an example of uh, two electoral commissions, here's one for Australia. They do really nice job with their elections uh, and sort of making their election data available. It's just you know, nicely sort of laid out here. You can browse kind of back by time period and they have all their data available. It's all available in like spreadsheets. It's really nice to just be able to download it all in one go. Uh, this is a little bit more typical if you're dealing with elections uh, in other countries that you'll find, you know, often there are really good sites, especially European countries, obviously they're the more developed world, um, but they'll be all in the native language. Sometimes in some countries they'll have like an English language version, so it's worth kind of uh, browsing around, but very often the English language version of a government site from other countries is going to be bare bones and won't have all the detailed uh, data that you want. So sometimes you have to just uh, go through the native language interface and, you know, Google Translate would be your friend here to kind of like uh, cludge your way through this, um, but you can usually get to the, the general uh, area you need to go. And often they have these sort of nice like little interactive features you can like uh, visualize data but often they have the data just all directly um, downloadable uh, on some of the better sites like this one from Germany. You can even get it down here at the individual sort of, uh, you know, uh, regional sort of province level here in Germany. Um, another thing to, I'll just mention is, uh, this is from Puerto Rico actually, um, that many places um, will have sort of a dedicated, if you look at the URL up here, um, you can actually link to this from their election commission, but when you get into individual elections, they have just their own sort of unique URL that's dedicated just to a particular election. And so that's not uncommon for many different countries if they just set up a, a unique website that just, you know, prior to the election will have information about how to register and how to vote for this upcoming election and, and have sort of news and data, uh, our news and analysis about what's coming up. And then after the election, they'll actually report uh, the results here and you can kind of go through and sort of, you know, drill down to whatever level of information uh, they provide. This one, you know, being Puerto Rico, it's nice because it has it both in, in Spanish and in English version. Um, now on the open government, like I mentioned, um, you know, even if you can find the data um, election by election, sometimes these open government sites in some places, like France has a really nice open government data site that has a ton of data about elections here that's all pulled together in sort of nice machine readable format. Um, and a lot of this goes back a, a fair way in time. And so, you know, you can kind of browse through um, things like that. So sometimes that's a good place to look for as well if you're not finding sort of a, a major electoral body that presents it in a nice data format, that's a, a place to look. Um, other places to look on, especially in the machine readable sort of form is like independent research centers in a particular country um, or social science data archives or, or country statistical agencies, right? Um, <clears throat> these can be really, really helpful. As an example, you know, here's like the UK data archive, you know, they, they do a great job on a lot of stuff um, and they have a whole section related just to, you know, elections and these sort of election data sets that have been compiled often by uh, researchers over time. So sometimes, especially when you're looking for historical data, that can be useful. Uh, here's an example of a statistical website from Statistics Norway, um, which, you know, we, we love our Scandinavian friends, especially they have such great uh, social science data archives and statistical agencies. They put some amazing stuff up. And this has got just like this great table. It's got all this historical data. and You can go in and just kind of like, you know, filter your table by exactly what you want and then get it in a nice data format and download it, which is super cool. Uh, other places, especially in the developing world, it's, it's harder to come by and often the government uh, websites, if they exist, won't have any useful information or they'll be broken. That's like super common. Uh, so here's an example like this one. Is not, this is actually a research center uh, out of a university in India. Um, and this is not uncommon, like when you're dealing with sort of foreign uh, election stuff to run into some weird problem. You're like, what on earth is this? Fortunately, this one, um, that's just like a weird sort of like uh, Linux error or something and the actual site works most of the time. Um, and so like this is an independent center, center that has pulled together um, a lot of elections data uh, going back in time for the, uh, the Lok Sabha in um, uh, sort of the national parliament in India going back over time, um, which otherwise has been really, really hard to find for India. So this is, um, this is a great source. Other sources that you can look at, <clears throat> um, don't discount Wikipedia, right? Like um, it's amazing. Like I'm always surprised at what's in Wikipedia, but um, you know, it's particularly useful. I don't ever use it for like, uh, for the most part for actually getting election data, but I use it especially as, you know, most of you probably want to do to find data that 
you can find like official sources, right? So looking at, you know, tables of sources in here and saying, okay, where can I go to find the actual reports and see like, you know, was there some kind of an official report or website listed here where I can actually drill down and get the data in machine readable format. Um, and so uh, these are super great. They're also great for finding sometimes like these random one-off like, you know, uh, monographs that were published on a particular election, especially historical that you can leverage for, for additional data. Um, now, sort of outside of kind of those major sources, sometimes news sites um, are going to be your best bet in especially many countries. Uh, these often just be at sort of like, you know, the national level. Sometimes they've got nice visualizations for, for major countries that you can drill down into. Um, sometimes the best you're going to do is just to get sort of results um, kind of in a list format and it won't be sort of machine readable data. Um, the very best sites are going to look sort of like this one from Ireland, Just nice visualizations. You can drill down into any of these little sort of constituencies and zooms you in. You can get all the data down here and see the individual candidates, all of this. It's super cool. Um, <clears throat> so those are, they're true. Even for many developing countries, sometimes um, those will be your best bet in terms of finding that data. Other types of places you can go um, are sort of like hobbyist sites, right? There are lots of people that are super interested in elections, and especially for particular individual countries. Um, that may be your best, your best best. Just do a bunch of searching online until you find somebody who's maybe been compiling this. Um, as an example, um, Adam Carr has been doing this for a long time, and he actually covers stuff across the world. You know, this is not machine readable data, um, and usually it's just at the national level. Um, some countries have like uh, subnational stuff, but you know, there's a ton of stuff in here and um, you know, you can see like these, often he has like these cool maps, uh, even if you don't get like, you know, the individual sort of like data. Um, oh, I went into the map section there. I didn't mean to do that. Um, but if you go into the listing here, you can see the countries that are covered, which country and elections that he covers. This can be particularly useful for like presidential elections. I haven't really talked much about that. Um, presidential elections are actually a little bit harder to find in general in terms of um, sort of the reporting. And that's because often many uh, less democratic countries across the world uh, tend to have presidential systems. And so they haven't been as forthcoming with posting their data. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, lots of great sources in here that you can use. Um, and then the final thing I'll just mention is, you know, looking for reference works on elections. And I know I'm probably like blown way past my time. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just to say, you know, there are lots of, of election sources um, that sometimes you can look at. There, the one I'll just, last one I'll finish with here is um, Dieter Nolan um, had put together this really fabulous uh, selection of these massive reference works. They're like a thousand or 2000 pages long <laughs> covering election data from different countries all around the world. And it took like 20 years to publish these. Um, and so it's a super great source. You know, if you have them at your library, if you don't, I recommend going out and buying a copy if you can afford it. Um, and if they're still in print, because um, these are pretty amazing for many countries, they'll be often your best bet for both context and data. And I know I just realized I blew way past my time, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> well, thank you both very much for sharing your expertise. I know I had my camera off, but I definitely went bug-eyed at like a couple of these resources. Like, oh my God, that's perfect. That's exactly what I've always needed. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of love, especially for Adam Carr and for Wikipedia in the chat. And something that I always love about these webinars is the audience is also sharing some resources in the chat. So if folks are, interested in some of those, those links are there. And I'll open things up with a question that Loris asked that I think was inspired by your presentation, Jeremy, but might be more for Catherine. Um, does Texas still have multiple seat state house districts? Um, apparently they did in the mid-century. That really surprised me. I was not aware of that. So I would open it up to anyone to please chime in. Um, anybody else is probably more of an expert on Texas legislature than I am. Um, I went over to the to the House of Representatives and was looking through their resources, and it looks to me like it's one person um, representing a district. But um, yeah, I, that, that was a really interesting thing. I mean, that's that's that really that that blows my mind. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'd have to go uh, research it. Like. Catherine was saying, I don't know. Um, mostly, like I mentioned, you know, the United States is mostly a first past the post kind of system, um, but there is increasingly uh, starting to be like 
play, different places in the United States that are experimenting with new forms, right? A good example, maybe the most prominent one in recent times, in New York City's recent mayoral election, which used ranked choice voting, right, for the first time, right? Um, different places, municipalities, big cities um, have been more likely to go that route over time. I think San Francisco has done this in the past. There's some other places. Interestingly, you know, uh, the Constitution allows states to set the times and determinations for voting in their jurisdiction. So actually, I think it's Maine, where the last couple of years has been experimenting with ranked choice voting in their congressional district, right? And so like, which is super interesting, right? That like, that's pretty <laughs> different than what we're used to other places. And uh, so it's really interesting to see that kind of laboratory of democracy happening at the state level. And hopefully more of that's going to happen over time, because I think there's a lot of sense that, like, you know, we need to play around some different systems in the United States and see if we can come up with some better outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And Chelsea's noting in the chat that the potential for ranked choice voting, uh, there's potential for ranked choice voting in Washington state, which uh, I'm, I moved from Washington and they make a cool change like that. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, comment again that uh, chat is open, Q&A is open for folks to participate uh, and ask some questions, but I'll ask one of my own to kind of keep the conversation going. I, I'm always kind of curious to ask, like, what are people's, like, weirdest questions that they've asked? And that kind of extends to a question that I also like to ask, which is, what's like a sleeper source that you love to refer people to that maybe you mentioned in your presentation, maybe you didn't, but like, your sort of favorite thing to be like, oh, I am so excited that I get to recommend this to you. Well, one thing I thought of, and this was um, suggested in the chat as well uh, by Christopher, is the um, Dave Leap data. Mm. And uh, that was one of the things I felt like I couldn't include because of time, but I'm really glad he mentioned it because it is a great source for data, and he includes the link there in the chat as well. If you aren't familiar with it, one thing that's really striking about it is that Dave Leap um, doesn't use the uh, doesn't use red and blue the way that we've all come to um, used to seeing it, where red means Republican and blue means Democrat. He uses it the other way. So, um, if you're working with a student, there's just that like initial shock. Um, but then, you know, you can adjust. And he's got this whole explanation of why he likes it that way. Um, yeah, the backstory on that, I think, is that historically, he started doing those maps before that became a convention, which is one of those things that actually sparks an interesting conversation with your students, right? That, like, that's not always been the case, right? That, like, red was Republican, blue was Democrat, right? That's a recent innovation since, like, you know, kind of the 80s, 90s or whatever. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's useful to think about. Like, we could do these different colors entirely. We could do purple and green, right? And, like, see, like, how that shakes things up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that that's one that I that I really like. And and um, you know, one nice thing if you purchase data from him is, and you're you're able to host data locally in your library is, then you have it there and it's set and it's always the same for when you go back to it. Um, so that's that would be one that I I always turn to because I know it's always going to be the same. Whereas so many other interfaces change and then you gotta figure it out. Yeah, and sort of similarly, Canadian notes that the colors are swapped, or Nadine notes in Canada that the, the colors are swapped. There's always like a brief moment of like, oh, right, for me when I'm looking at, at Canadian data. And so you, I'll, I'll also kind of slide in here because we did get a question in the chat. Uh, I'm wondering about the timing of availability for US election data. How soon after elections can we usually get data? And then does that depend on state or level of election? And you know, does it depend on which source you consult also? Which I, I really like all of the different elements of that. Thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, and that's such an interesting question. And it's one that um, would have like would have been interesting, would we even be wondering this before the 2020 presidential election, which was like a whole thing. Um, but like, you know, a lot of times the, the state's board of elections or secretary of state, they wait until things are like officially, the, those counts are official. And so whatever process that is. And so um, remembering the news in the 2020 cycle, um, it takes a while before those counties certify and then the state certifies and then they would post it. So you can get, um, you know, preliminary data from the news often that night before you go to bed. 
um, the night of the election, but the official results will take, you know, way longer depending on how long it takes your state to certify. Um, and then sometimes states investigate, right? And so then they, they well, not sometimes, I guess very specifically in our <laughs> most recent election, there were some states that decided to um, look into it again. So uh, yeah, it's, that's a very interesting question on when things are official and when is it done and when is it over? And it also matters depending on the kind of data you're looking for, right? So like, you know, sort of the, the time, like individual constituencies sort of district level results, those can come out fairly free, fairly fast. And, you know, like even the electoral commissions themselves will often report that stuff same night, like the provisional results, like Catherine was mentioning, and then the official reports can take weeks, depending on whatever the state regulation deadlines are for certifying. Um, but getting data that's down below the constituency level. So if you want to look at like precinct data, right, or other kinds of geographies, that can sometimes take a long time, right? Because, um, you know, many states don't have any requirement that that actually has to be reported from the counties to the state level, like the Secretary of State or the Division of Elections. Often it's just a courtesy. <laughs> and because the, the elections are governed at the county level, and so you have to go to the county website to find that official data, right? And that can take a long time sometimes to produce. Sometimes it's never produced in like a machine readable format. Like it just depends on how rural the county is, how poor, how ancient its electoral systems are. With, with, you know, foreign elections, same kind of deal, except that, you know, it would just will depend on, you know, who's running the election. So if it's a central election administrator, um, you're in a better shape than, you know, in a federal system. Sure, thank you. Um, we also have a question in the Q&A from Brett. Uh, just curious if you hear more from grad students, undergrads, or faculty with questions, and how do you respond differently? On elections data, I... <laughs> It's all over the place. I get questions from people all around the world, actually. Um, uh, so it just, you know, it doesn't, I, the level of, of researcher doesn't really matter for me. It depends on the research purpose, right? And I think that's something Catherine and I both mentioned, right? Like what they need is really going to depend on why they're trying to use the data or how they're trying to apply it. And so that's going to govern more of the answer than and other kinds of things, you know, with the exception that like, you know, maybe a grad student usually wants to collect data from like, they'll come and say like, I want to collect all this data from everywhere, right? <laughs> and I'll say like, well, you know what, you might want to scale that back because that's going to take 15 lifetimes. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, it will come down to kind of a conversation about like, you know, what is it you're trying to compare? Are those things actually comparable, right? Like when you're dealing with foreign election data, that becomes way trickier. Um, and, and then, you know, do you need it in machine readable format? You know, if so, your options are going to be way more limited unless you're willing to put in, you know, an enormous amount of time to collect it and, and, you know, transcribe it yourself. One pattern I see is with um, undergrads being more likely to think they're asking for results of, um, you know, who voted uh, this way in a presidential election um, by these other demographic indicators. Like, I want to know how women voted. I want to know how um, Hispanics voted, you know, evangelical Christians, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people who drive hybrid cars, like all sorts of stuff. And so um, I often have to have that conversation about, you know, well, we're not looking for the results. We're looking at exit polls or we're looking at some kind of um, like voter attitude study or other things like that. So that, that's one thing I've noticed. And I think I think because a lot of the news reporting doesn't make it super clear. So you'll see a lot of headlines that's like this group voted this way. So, um, so yeah, that, that's a moment that I, that I often take of explaining the differences between those two things. Sure, thank you. Uh, and I think, you know, that we're kind of at 11 mountain time, various other top of the hours uh, across the country. Brian has given me a great way to wrap things up. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Will the recording be available? And the answer is yes. This recording will be available on the Help YouTube and on the uh, Pippers website, which uh, was linked earlier. And I'm also going to take this opportunity to drop a link in the chat. Uh, Pippers does a sur uh, survey at the end, so please do uh, let us know what you thought of this webinar, and uh, we'll, we'll take that into consideration as we go forward and 
plan future webinars. So thank you both to our present to our presenters and to Pippers for uh, helping us at help organize all of this. Um, it has been great to uh, to hear from you all and to see the the chat being so hopping. <laughs> so have a great day, everyone. <laughs>